skinny librarian or bookseller how popular Paul Jennings is, and they'll chuckle. They can hardly keep up with the demand. Since 1985, when his first book, Unreal, was published, Paul Jennings has been Australia's most popular kids' author, and it's no wonder why. Mr. Paul Jennings. By March 1992, Paul had sold over one million books worldwide and was awarded with a gold puffin before hundreds of fans. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Can you see the light coming on? My first ever was when I was uh, trying to get published was when I was 15. And uh, I, I sent a story into Woman's Weekly and it was rejected. And I was mortally wounded by that. It was my first rejection. And so I didn't write again until I was about 38. And uh, I sent what I call my first proper manuscript into Penguin and a couple of stories. And uh, they rang up and said, why don't you come down and have a talk to us about these stories? We're quite interested. So I said, tomorrow I do. <laughs> After about two more stories, they said, yes, the books are go. We'll give you a contract. And I actually photocopied my first cheque from them, which was $400 advance <laughs> for Unreal. Oh, no! 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 Yes. Yes! Yes. Paul's stories had been such a hit, it seemed a great idea to make them into a television series. Converting the paperbacks to television scripts was a big job and a lot of changes had to be made. Understandably, Paul wanted the task, but since this kind of writing was new to him, he needed assistance for the 18-month process that lay ahead. Uh, the first series was much more difficult than the second series, because in the first series we had to invent a context. We had to invent the whole situation of, of the lighthouse. We had to invent the twist family. Uh, and we would have spent perhaps six months just doing that. How that worked out was that Paul lived at the time in Warrnambool. We found that both of us liked a uh, place called Port Campbell. So we were both drawn to sort of setting it near the ocean. Then gradually, somehow, we came up with the idea of, of, of setting it in a lighthouse. In that the lighthouse always uh, has a sort of romantic connotation for a lot of people. And there's sort of poetry and mystery involved with the lighthouses. And then we had to work out what our characters were, you know, dad, the kids, what was the balance, uh, male-female balance, what was the age balance, was there a mother, wasn't there a mother, what had happened to the mother. Um, and that all went through sort of six months of uh, gestation. Well, I play Tony Twist, the children's father. I have three children, two of whom are twins. Uh, Mrs. Twist died some years ago, that happened in the first series. And Tony Twist is elected to leave the rat race and, you know, go off on his dream and take the kids into a more idyllic, environmentally friendly place and pursue his passion, which is sculpting. Um, and he's a fairly um, loose sort of a father, um, but he's always there when, when authority is needed or, you know, a crisis develops. But he's, um, he's fairly vague, I suppose. Um, the kids can get up to all sorts of strange adventures and he didn't, hardly even notices. Keen to give females an equal role, the parts of Linda and Nell were developed. Well, the way I see her is that she's the spirit of the sea. Um, I don't know whether Paul intended that because originally it was a man called Old Tom and then they changed it to Nell and I think she only comes out when the lighthouse is threatened, or where there's an injustice, or when one of the, the, some of the folklore is being probed. She's really the wisdom, I think. Have you ever, ever felt like this? No way, I'm not wearing lipstick. It'll make Fiona kiss you. It'll make any girl kiss you. When we came to make it for the TV, the director said to me, Paul, You've got to change this story. He said, first of all, I want the boy to be a nice boy, and in the end, he will get a kiss, a real kiss from this girl. I said, no, 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 no. He's, he's a mean kid using that lipstick. And he said, Paul, nice kids do silly things sometimes. Make him a nice kid. So we made it Pete the hero, 
And in the end, I wrote a little speech for him when he gets his real kiss. He's sitting there on a rock by the beach and Fiona comes up to him and she says, this was my first love scene I had ever written. <laughs> and she says, uh, Pete, you don't have to steal kisses. Not you. And anyway, a stolen kiss isn't a real kiss at all. And then she gently lifts up his chin and she kisses him on the lips. And I thought, oh, that's really lovely. You know, I really like writing that. And uh, when they came to cast the show, they advertised for kids who wanted to be in Round the Twist, took them down to a big studio, and it was full of kids who all around about 12 or 13 who wanted these parts. So they gave them two pages of scripts each to act. They had to go and rehearse it, come out the front. There was a long table. I sat there, the director sat there, the producer sat there to see which kids are good enough to get the part. And they gave them that love scene out of round the twist. And uh, these kids had to come out one at a time, read out those lines, and even though they'd never met each other before, they had to kiss each other. <laughs> and I found it a terribly moving experience because I was, set, I was there sitting there thinking, all these people are kissing each other just because of me. You know? <laughs> And it was a really nice feeling. In the second round of the Twist series, the characters of Dad, Miss James and Nell stayed on, but the rest of the cast was new. How do you feel having three new kids in the series? Well, no problem at all, really. I mean, th these kids are fantastic, as were the first three kids. Um, I'd say the difference between the kids is these kids are perhaps a little bit more streetwise, but also they come into it knowing about it and knowing what went down. Whereas we all in the first series, the kids and everyone, it was a, a naive sort of innocence about it all, which is not, you can never have to get that back basically. That's there for the first time, but it's not in this series. But I think the casting has been absolutely fantastic because they've taken the essence of the kids that were in the first series and they're in these kids as well. They're, they're similar but different. The whole feel of this series is, is much more confidence. We've done it before, we know what we're doing. And um, I can feel that in Ayers in, in his direction. I feel that in myself. I, I know the character far better. The second series is a lot easier for us because all our characters are in place. We don't have to work out our situation. We didn't have to work out the lighthouse. We didn't have to work out Dad's character. We didn't have to work out Pete Linder and Bronson's character. We didn't have to work out the gang. Uh, uh, chemistry. We didn't have to work out what the gribbles did and all that sort of stuff. So usually what happens, we need a plot and a plot usually means that you need a sort of, uh, you need a conflict between good and evil and that means we need a conflict between the twists and the gribbles. I always thought, you know, Gribble was a bit up himself but then after I read the scripts and stuff like that, he's, I thought, you know, oh, I could play this guy, he's a bit of a terror. You know, all he does is ramage around and tease people. When it came to production, a couple of episodes stand out, such as how they made Little Squirt. Well, <laughs> it's not real, of course, but um, the special effects gave us little tubes and we had, they were brought up our, up the, our legs, up the side of our pants, and we just had to, like, we had to control it and stuff, and they'd, they'd pump the, the, the thing, and it was, we had to go up the wall, and I, I had to, you know, there was little marks of where I had to hit and then Bronson had to get over the wall and stuff like that. It was, it was very funny. It took us about, because we had to do so many different angle shots, do so many shots and like, it just took so long. I think, I think, we'll meet, I think the estimated time we were meant to spend on that one scene was about three hours and I think it took us about nine hours to film it. In Pink Bow Tie, the story was set on a boat and that created an interesting situation. Pink by time when we're filming on the ferry, um, you know, you'd think when we get on the ferry, you know, somebody's going to fall off the edge and stuff. I think we lost about four mugs, three shoes, and um, we lost a lot of scarves and stuff like that. And it was it was pretty it was pretty bad weather when we filmed that though. We were on the ferry, the original story was set on the train, and they didn't want to set it on the train. First of all, I thought it was a bit boring, and secondly, a train's really expensive to get and we've done a train in the first episode, so they asked me to set it on the ferry. And I've set it on the Queenscliff Ferry. That's also nice because it ties in with our sort of maritime setting. That was really hard. I had to go to the ferry and 
you know, they were very nice. They let me look all around. I had to write it specifically for that ferry for the stairs and the room and the rope lockers. And um, it's got really big special effects because people have to age. You know, they have to go from a baby up to old age and turn into a skeleton and scare the kids. And of course we had to put the gang into it who weren't in the original story. We, um, we, we um, had to walk all around the boat at the start and just, just keep rocking from side to side and just making everyone feel sick. We managed to make pretty much everyone feel sick and throw up off the side of the boat. But um, we, we couldn't get Mr Twist to throw up and he made us throw up instead because he started going as well. So. Plus nothing like the original story. In writing the film scripts, Paul found there were quite a few restraints placed on him, something he wasn't used to as a short story writer. I've got to do things that everyone else likes, the producer, the executive producer, the director, and um, it's really hard to please everybody, and they have a say too. Everybody from makeup wants has their creative input. You know, even the costumes, I might think, oh, I didn't think he'd look like that. But that's their creative bit. They aren't going to be influenced by what I want very much. Um, so I don't have total control, um, which I couldn't have, and I wouldn't want it. I mean, I'm, I couldn't do a young Einstein and write, spar, direct, produce. That's not. Well, I, I have no ambitions to do that. But I, when, when I've got a book, I do do that. I, I do the whole lot, and I've got a very good book editor who points out weaknesses to me but it's basically up to me, I don't have to please anyone else. Often it was the budget that limited Paul's script writing. I wanted a dog, but they said to me, well look Paul, the dog's going to cost about $10,000, you know, you've got to pay the wrangler and he's got to be there every day and he's got to stay there in the motel and uh, everywhere the kids go, the dog has to go, so the, you know, do you really want the dog in it? And I said, yeah, I want the family to have a dog, so they said, all right, well you can... You can, you can have the dog, but you can't have the ghost scene in the last episode because that's where the money's going to go. So I said, cut the dog, you know. In Round the Twist 1, similar limitations existed. The kids, especially the little kids, are only allowed to do a certain percentage at night. So uh, a couple of times I've had to change the scenes because one of the little actors has used up his nighttime quota and he's not allowed to do any more until he's had a rest for a week. In A Good Tip for Ghosts that happened. I had um, Rodney, uh, who plays Bronson, he went through the whole of the tip adventure with the ghost with the kids and I had a lot of really good jokes for him in there. And then they just said, Rodney's used up his nighttime hours, write him out. And I was like, oh rats, you know, he's got some great jokes that I can't give to older kids. And it was just gone and I had to do it at the last minute. But Paul feels strongest about the words his characters say. Sometimes a, an actor will make a line up and it, when I watch the show, it hits me in the head right, because I know I didn't write it. It's, I can, as soon as I hear it, I know I didn't write that. That's not the way I speak. And um, sometimes it's better. You know, other people think it's better, but I always wince. We had a thing in uh, the la last series um, where Frankie J. Holden, who was playing Mr. Gribble, he was uh, taking some Arabs around, uh, showing them uh, dad's sculptures, and he said to them, don't buy any of these sculptures. He said, you wouldn't give it, and, and I wrote, you wouldn't give it to your mother-in-law, because he's a very sexist sort of guy. And he said, whoops, sorry, mothers-in-law, because they were Arabs who have more than one wife. And um, it was funny, so we left it in, but I didn't make it up. <laughs> so what motivates Paul Jennings to write? Well, one reason is to produce Australian stories. That gives me a really big buzz, I mean, it's, I just think it's a pity when the kids sort of feel that Ninja Turtles or Simpsons or the, or the dinosaurs it is now, whatever's going to come out from America is going to be good and any stories about Australia can't be good. And all my stories are set in Australia. They're all about Australian kids, our language, our jokes, you know, our dunnies, whatever. And that gives me a big buzz because um, Kids need to know that their culture is worth writing stories about and their, their stories are just as good as anyone else's. So that, that's really important to me.